is going to hell down here in Texas. Welcome to the show. This is episode number 202 of the Lone Gummin Podcast. I'm your host, Rob Clark, and I have some guests today. With me today are Richard Eves and Mark Pittman. Welcome, fellas, to the show. Yeah, glad to be here. we're glad to be here. Well, it's good to have you. I haven't had some guests in a while, so it's definitely good to have some people on here to talk to about this kind of thing. Um, we're going to be talking about your book, The Girl Who Shot JFK, today. Um, but before we get into it, um, if you could just let my uh, listeners know a little bit about yourselves uh, individually and maybe how you guys met and got interested in all this crazy stuff. OK, well, I'll start you off. I, I'm Richard Eves. I was uh, I was born and raised in Dallas and I happened to be downtown uh, the day that Kennedy got shot. I was there accidentally. I'd gone down to apply for a job at the morning news and I was. Uh, oh, wow. Everybody was uh, had gone down to see um, the, the parade, so I was walking north on Houston to go up and meet with my brother-in-law, who was a Dallas police officer, Gene Barnett, who was right stationed right below the Texas School Book Depository. So <clears throat> on the way down there, that's when the shooting started. So that's uh, that's how I got involved in the Kennedy assassination. Did uh, you see I, Jack Ruby at the morning news? I'm sorry. <laughs> Did you see Jack Ruby at the morning news? I did see Jack Ruby. <clears throat> and I, had, I knew Jack Ruby from a couple of previous encounters uh, with through my brother-in-law, who, as a police officer, was sta- stationed on the corner of Commerce and Ackard, just down the street from where Ruby's Carousel Club was. And Ruby would uh, stop there almost daily to chat with my brother-in-law. They, they, they became quite friendly. And on the days I would go down to pick up my wife, uh, at the, at, who worked at the Sanger Harris store in Dallas, I would go over and chat with my brother-in-law w- until my wife got off of work. And several times Jack Ruby came by. So that's how I, that, I kind of got to know the guy yeah, peripherally. I didn't know him very well, but uh, I knew of him and he knew me on site. He and I knew each other on site. So that's uh, sort of how I got involved, how I know about it and know a little about it. But at the time, I was not the least interested in what was going on with it. Uh, I had, I was a young guy, uh, just got married, had a lot of things on my plate, so I didn't uh, didn't pay any attention to the um, the Kennedy s- situation. I knew I knew what it was like in Dallas at the time. It was a very conservative city, a lot of right wing uh, Republicans there, and I also knew uh, um, I had a couple of encounters with uh, Lee Harvey Oswald. Just once again, peripherally, peripherally, uh, really? not uh, nothing in, in depth, but uh, yeah, uh, I get into that later. But uh, uh, I went on to become a uh, a writer. I got into the advertising business. That's how I met Mark. I would write commercials, uh, and um, while I was working at an ad agency, and Mark would, was in the production business, and he was a uh, a he would produce uh, TV commercials. So he and I got to know each other uh, that way. Uh, we later on we lost contact with each other, and then uh, sometime around uh, 2015 or 16, we reconnected when he was in Houston to do some uh, some work here in Houston. And we started talking about some things, and we we realized that we knew we both knew some things about the Kennedy assassination that uh, heretofore had never come out. So we decided to write it, so put a website and start writing about it. And that's what got us here. Pretty oh, cool. And Mark, you weren't singing these jingles on the commercials, were you? No. They weren't jingles. They were, they were, they were film commercials. <laughs> no, 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 okay. We weren't, we weren't quite doing that. We were doing about everything else, I'll tell you that. That's for sure. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Mark, when you met up with Richard here, uh, 
when you reconnected in, in 2015 or so, um, I think you had a pretty crazy story that you told him about, right? Yeah, we were we were reminiscing, trying to fill in all the gaps between the years we'd not been together. And I, I'd move, after working with Dick in Houston, I moved to Mexico and started producing uh, films and TV commercials down there. And um, so, you know, it was a lot to catch up on, a lot of stories, a lot of, you know, things that, 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 were, that were quite interesting, to be truthful. And so one of the stories that I told him was this this trip that I went to Cuba. I went to Havana and, um, you know, it was just a, it was just a, a crazy trip with, a, with two other guys. And only one thing on our mind was to just to, to just meet as many good looking women as we could and just, <laughs> just have this incredible time, you know, and, and, uh, you know, we rented a, we rented a house on the beach with a swimming pool. And as the girls would come by, we would invite them to go swim. And I mean, it was just one party after another wall to wall. And, uh, the last sounds like a movie to hangover. Oh, it was just, <laughs> that's what I'm envisioning. <laughs> we, you know, it's kind of funny. We were, you know, I was in my mid forties and I took a case of insure with me and I was drinking insure one right after another so that I would always be ready to fire off. And by me tell you, <laughs> it was amazing. So anyway, so the last night, you know, we were we were a little bit tired of each other, uh, and we'd been you know 24 hours every day, every day, and so we kind of split up the, the three of us. And I uh, got in a cab with a, and I asked, I said, take me to a place where, you know, I won't see any guys from. The, you, there were first of all, there, there were hardly any, if any, Americans there at that time. It was impossible right. to go to, uh, and but there were Brits and there were guys from Italy and there were some foreigners. You know, they were definitely foreigners there, but not uh, not Americans. And I said, take me to a place where you know I, I just want to be with some Cuban folks and not see any foreigners. And and so this guy took me to this. Uh, well, it's it was. Um, it was in a, a building and it was kind of um, um, uh, underground in a sense that back in those days, uh, it was illegal to um, to use American money. The Cuban government did not want uh, the Cubans to have dollars. They wanted the Cubans, if they were going to have any dollars at all, they would have to buy them from the government. Well, people were setting up shops in their house. Uh, you know, I, I I would go to people's homes that <clears throat> would open it up to have dinner and they'd go sit in their living room and they would cook you a dinner and, you know, you could listen to eight track cassettes and all that kind of stuff. So it was it was all hush hush and, un, you know, behind scenes. And so this guy took me to this place where <clears throat> where you could meet some uh, there were guys and girls there. And, and um, so. um it was interesting because in order to go in, you had to go in with someone of the opposite sex. You couldn't go in just by yourself. So there were some women out in front, and I took one of them in. And um, But once you got inside, you could bail around and, and change partners and look around and talk to different people. And it was – so um, to make a long story short, you know, I, I did see this attractive girl, and I started talking to her and – one thing led to another, and you know, uh, of course, you know, alcohol was always part of the formula. We just, you know, got snockered, and um, you know, she was telling me some crazy things. And but crazy things to tourists are, are, are things that people tell you. I mean, like you know, you're in Cuba, they'll everyone will tell you that they knew Hemingway, or, or they'll tell you their their cousin was part of the revolution with Fidel, or you know, uh, their their grandfather was a, a waiter with the mob, and you know, all that kind of. So they they know that history of Cuba. And they use it to, to sort of like tantalize tourists. So I just I played along. What the hell? You know, just listen to these stories and get drunk with this pretty girl. Have, some, have a good time. Why not? You know? Yeah. And so um, one thing led to another. And she was telling me some things that were off the wall. You know, that her mother was 
an assassin for Q, for for Castro and that uh, you know hemming away and all just one thing after another. And I, you know, I was interested in just one thing, not her stories, but something else, right? So, uh, you know, we ended up spending <clears throat> the evening together, and um, it was remarkable, <laughs> I got to tell you. And um, the, but the main thing was that uh, when we got back to her place, there was a photograph of a woman who she said was her mother and uh, with a with a, a sniper's rifle and so that so wow well, you know maybe maybe her mother was really did you know shoot people for castro and maybe maybe he really maybe she really was in dallas you know maybe maybe it did happen you know but i but then you know you got to figure you know you're you know you, you're you're getting out of there. You're racing back to the hotel. You grab your bags. You're getting on your plane. You got to catch your plane. You got to get back into Mexico. You got to. So, you know, that that whole thing sort of laid dormant. That whole story laid dormant. And, uh, you know, years go by and it was just meeting with Dick and then sort of regurgitating the past that that story came out. And then, of course, his story came out about physically being there. And, and then we say, wow, we, we we have a story here. We need to sit down and, and, and talk about this. And that's how it all began. Yeah. And, and you know, it's, it's fascinating. Like, well, truth be told here, fellas, it, it, I'm sure looking into the JFK assassination over the years, you know, there's there's a lot of stories out there about supposed assassins. Um Lee Harvey Oswald, Jack Ruby. There's there's just stories that are all over the place, and people that have claimed to be uh, the shooters, and and these theories and that theories. I mean, I've even seen theories where you know people were saying that John F. Kennedy was a a giant spider, um, <laughs> and I kid you not. Um, I've, I've read time traveling stories. I mean, I've I've seen it all. I've I've heard it all. <laughs> and honestly, you know, I, I stumbled across your website, um, the girl who shot JFK.com, if anybody wants to go check it out. Um, and I'm thinking to myself, okay, here's another crazy story. Like, what the hell is going on here? And I read through everything. And the more I read, I'm like, okay, there's a lot of very well researched details here. Um, you know, and then I'm thinking to myself, okay, is this a story? Or is this a a book? Is it fiction or is it nonfiction? And that's where the the lines get blurred for me. And oh, that's well, why I wanted to talk to you guys in person, you know, and, and see for myself and hear for myself, you know, the truth of everything. So, well, to answer your question, there's there's really some of yeah. each in there uh, <laughs> in this story. Most of it is based on fact as we know it, uh, and there's there are some uh, there's a lot of the, 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 obviously there's, there's a lot of conjecture in here. Uh, the only thing I know for sure is that nobody's ever going to know for sure who killed Kennedy. We'll never know that. Right. Even 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 though we we think we know who some of the shooters were, we you can't pin down who exactly shot the guy or who which shot actually killed the guy, but we think there were a number of shooters there. Uh, but you can never say, well, who exactly killed a guy? I personally believe that the, the shot that killed him came from this, this guy, Jimmy Files. Now, everybody everybody I've uh, heard from kind of poo-poos Jimmy Files' confession, but I found the guy to be pretty credible, but that's beside the point. Uh, but we, you know, based on things we learned from research and kind of know firsthand from well, I, let me retra- take that back. We don't know for sure firsthand, but we heard from credible sources some of the a lot of the material in here, and and a lot of the stuff we heard came from sources that people haven't heard of before, or they 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 have heard of, but not in the context that we heard it. If that makes any sense. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, for sure. For example, yeah, go ahead. Well, for example, uh, 
a lot of the, uh, not a lot, but some of the information came from a guy named Frenchie Brule or Brulette uh, uh, in New Orleans, who was a, an associate of uh, Carlos Marcello, a kind of a low level grunt with, uh, who worked uh, for Carlos Marcello. He was a drinking buddy with a good friend of mine that I uh, hooked, met in uh, in Houston back in the, sometime in the mid 80s. At a, we, when, uh, when Frenchie would come to Houston for business, uh, on, on business for Marcello, he would uh, stop by and uh, have drinks with this guy named Dale Walker, uh, whom I used to work with in the advertising business. And Frenchie, after Marcello's death, he told a lot of stories that he wouldn't have told otherwise. Uh, he would be afraid to tell some of the things he told after, while Marcello was alive, but that a lot of the stories he told us were after, sort of after the fact. And he personally knew uh, Pilar. In fact, he was, she was one of his girlfriends, Pilar being the girl who shot JFK. So some of the information we have comes from a source like that, which is pure hearsay, obviously, but it it seemed credible to me uh, at the time or, or after after I had a time to think about it, it, it seemed more credible to me. So anyway, there, there are some sources like that that we we stumbled across or we or we came in contact with uh, that gave us some of this information that nobody yeah, when, pretty, uh, here before nobody uh, had heard of. Well, yeah, when you start putting the puzzle pieces together from, you know, what Mark experienced and then what's you know, stuff coming from a totally different source, this other guy, because I, I believe, Mark, you, you're you talking about meeting her daughter, Lords, correct? Right. That's and, right. Uh, you know, this you have this other guy, Frenchie, speaking about, you know, her mother. And I know Pilar is not her, quote, real name. Um, but, you know, the puzzle pieces kind of start fitting together. You know, the more you're thinking, OK, well, I got this crazy story and I got this story. Well, it kind of matches up right here, you know. That's exactly right. That's so, exactly. one of the one of the most, uh, I, I would say, probably in depth parts of your your website. I I, I haven't read the book yet. I'm sure it's in the book as well. Um, but is the background on Jack Ruby and, and a lot of that stuff about Ruby. Um, you know, I, I wasn't even aware of half the stuff that y'all were talking about, um, his connections, what he was into, what he was doing. Um, if, you, if y'all could speak a little bit about that. Well, uh, Ruby was really a, a, a mysterious figure. He, the guy was, uh, he was, he seemed like, he, it's not, it seems like he it pops up everywhere. He was in, uh, he was doing a lot of work in Cuba. He was running guns to Cuba back in the 50s. Uh, mm-hmm. Uh, not, not. But this is before Castro even. He was running guns for Carlos, the uh, the the group that was trying to kick uh, Carlos Prio out of office. Uh, Carlos Prio was the president uh, that was in, in power when when Batista took over. But there were right. groups are already trying to get rid of uh, Prio before uh, Batista came over, or, or before P- Batista staged a coup and took over. So it seems like in Cuba, there was always a revolution or a coup d'etat or something uh, brewing, and they were always needing guns. And Ruby, uh, through a guy named uh, Dave Yaris, who was a childhood friend of Ruby's, uh, uh, Yaris put uh, Ruby on the the gun running business in Cuba, uh, 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 out of Florida. So Ruby was uh, heavily involved in running guns to Cuba uh, back in the 50s, uh, the mid mid to late 50s. Mm-hmm. Uh, later on, and of course Ruby is the kind of guy uh, who would sell guns to anybody. I mean, he didn't didn't he didn't he was not a political animal. He didn't care if they were, uh, you know, uh, communist, capitalist, or what. You know, he just wanted to sell guns. Yeah, as long so as they he, had money, right? Uh, I'm sorry. I said as long as they had money. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So uh, he hooked up. Ruby hooks up with a guy named uh, uh, Robert McKeon in Houston. <laughs> and McKeon, oh, yeah. uh, he and McKeon uh, ended up buying a boat, and they would run guns from uh, out of Kima, Texas, into Cuba. Uh, for this is when after Castro uh, staged his revolution. 
So uh, Ruby has a long and storied history of running guns and, uh, and also working with a mob. Uh, the mob would uh, they would actually steal guns out of out of uh, out of National Guard armories in Louisiana and then sell them to uh, to the rebels in Cuba. And, and Ruby was, uh, you know, he, he was he had a, ties uh, he to the FBI an, and everything, too, didn't he? And, and uh, was he an FBI informant as well? Uh, yes, he was. He, and in fact, he was a uh, apparently he was a an informant for the uh, the FBI. He also worked with the CIA. He also worked with the mob, both in uh, Chicago and in New Orleans. Uh, the the mob had a big presence in Dallas. Uh, the, the Carlos Marcellus mob had a big presence in Dallas through the uh, the Joe Campisi family, which mm-hmm. ran the uh, the Egyptian Lounge, which has the greatest pizza in the world. <laughs> <laughs> I've eaten a lot of their pizza, and it's great. It's fabulous. But uh, so Ruby was he he was it seems like he was everywhere doing everything. He also worked. Uh, he, uh, my uncle. I had an uncle. Who was a sort of a uh, a loser? It's had to put it bluntly. The guy, everything the guy tried, uh, he failed. He was a kind of a hustler, and, and he never made it. And uh, he and he and Jack Ruby would uh, would go in to partner uh, would partner on uh, running parking lots in Dallas during the State Fair of Texas and during the Cotton Bowl games. So I kind of knew Ruby uh, it was again from uh, the outskirts. Uh, through my, his relationship with my uncle uh, back in the late 50s. So, and Ruby did a lot of things. He was, the guy was, he ran the two or three clubs uh, in Dallas that were uh, either uh, unsuccessful or just moderately successful. And he, the, his, uh, his carousel club was, you know, a kind of a second rate uh, colony club, which was run by a, a guy named Abe Weinstein, who was one of, Ruby's uh, nemesis. So he he tried a little of everything, and nothing seemed to work for the guy. Yeah, he, he was into he, the, the twist <laughs> boards, and uh, you know, like you said, the county fairs, state fairs. Um, I believe that's where he met uh, Larry Crayford, his his uh, his buddy there, um, who I think was responsible for you know a lot of these mistaken Oswald and Ruby together sightings. Um, what do you guys think about Oswald knowing Ruby at all? Well, he definitely knew Ruby. Uh, uh, Oswald, de- I don't, now I don't know how well he knew him, but uh, and it may have just he may have just been uh, uh, a guest in one of his clubs one time. But there's no doubt that uh, Oswald was actually in Ruby's club at one time. I don't, think there's a picture of him there. Don't forget, don't forget through the Uncle Dutch. In oh, yes. Right. Yeah. Right. Oh, he, he knew him as a child, he knew him as, a, as a youngster. That's right. <laughs> in fact, Ruby had a uh, had a fling with uh, Oswald's mother uh, in New Orleans back. She's what, 19, some part, sometime back in the 1940s, I believe. Oh, Lord, what the what was he thinking? <laughs> <laughs> well, she was a pretty she was a pretty good looking babe when she was younger. She wasn't bad. She didn't look like the granny. She was. When you saw her uh, during the uh, assassination, but she was not a bad-looking uh, woman when she was younger. Yeah, I haven't seen too many pictures of her young, young, young. I mean, she yeah. she might have been okay. I saw I did see a picture of her with her uh, second husband Edwin Ekdahl, and she was a lot slimmer, trimmer, and a lot less grandma-looking, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, even Jack Ruby's sister was not was a, was she wasn't bad looking either. Uh, Eva Rubenstein, she was she was okay. <laughs> yeah, Her standards are pretty low. So <laughs> <laughs> I've heard some crazy crazy Jack Ruby stories in, in the in the in the uh, you know from from doing all this, and Lord knows if all of them are true or not. But um, well, what, you know. Ever, you, even Robert Kennedy, uh, when they were uh, investigating, uh, uh, I think it was during the um, McClellan committee, and Ruby's name popped up, and they and they uh, 
they, they tried to find out as much as they could about Ruby, but they couldn't find out. There was much. There wasn't much they could find out. And and, and Robert Kennedy finally said, "Die to hell with this guy. We'll never get. We'll never figure this guy out." And they even, uh, you know, they even gave up on him. So he he was a slippery guy. It's it's really weird. But he he did know a lot of people. He did, he was connected to the mob in Chicago and in in, uh, in New Orleans, and that's that's pretty well documented. He he grew up, uh, you know, in Chicago, and he I believe if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, he may have even done some work with Al Capone I mean, when he was a really young guy, you know. Right. Yes, definitely sounds like Ruby was straddling both sides of the track. You know, was, when you look at Dallas and his relationship with the with the Dallas police. Um, and then, you know, he's doing the seedier side of things, but he's got a good uh, he's got a good repertoire with the Dallas police. And, you know, he's doing all these nefarious things, running guns. But he's he's, you know, talking to the mm-hmm. FBI as well, letting them know things. Um, What do you think? was the catalyst or the prompting for him to shoot Oswald in a room full of cops and press? Well, I, I personally think it was sheer desperation. The guy, uh, he was, he really had no choice. Uh, uh, he was told to get rid of Oswald, uh, but b- before Bill Decker got it, Bill Decker was the sheriff in, in Dallas County. And once Decker got in, they were not they were not going to be able to get to him. They didn't think so. Uh, uh, he being Oswald. So do you think the orders came from the mafia? To, I think so. Yeah. I, believe, I believe so. I don't know that, but I, I certainly believe that. Mark, what do you think? <laughs> well, you know, um, a, a lot of it would have would would either bring the heat on the mafia or bring the heat on the Cubans. I mean, I, I figure, I feel that like Dick said, he had to do it and he was ordered to do it. And probably in his mind, uh, he would, he would not, he would get a, some sort of a light sentence. He wouldn't get a real heavy one. Uh, but of course that's just conjecture on my part. Well, that's that, that's exactly right, and and he probably would have gotten a light sentence if he hadn't had this really idiot uh, attorney, Melvin <laughs> Belli, yeah. put on a, a terrible defense. Ruby Ruby should have gotten off with a couple of years in prison, but that idiot Belli uh, wanted to plead insanity and all that nonsense. And uh, but you know, a Ruby, uh, I think another reason they told Ruby to do it because they knew that Ruby could get into the Dallas City Hall because he was. Or the Dallas Jail, which is right right in the city hall. There, he was uh, he was in and out of there all the time. He was very uh, friendly with the police there. I actually worked in that building. I was I worked uh, I had worked as a a night clerk uh, at the at the um, city uh, the city court at uh, municipal court. I was there that summer working at night uh, while I was going to college, and I saw Ruby in and out of there a number of times. He was uh, he would stop in and chat with the police. He was sort of a wannabe police guy. He uh, and he also knew that in cultivating the police, it, it, they would stay off his ass when he was running the uh, the, the carousel club. Uh, maybe maybe stay off a little bit later than he should. Maybe he would serve liquor to somebody he shouldn't be serving it to, and they would cut him some slack, you know. So he always stayed always tried to stay on the good side of the police. Yeah, it's right. uh, if he knew that he could get into that, that building and maybe do it. Well, yeah, I mean, it definitely looked like he was kind of stalking Oswald all that that whole weekend. You know, even you know from the time of the midnight press conference on, he's posing as a as a as a press guy, a newspaper right. guy, correcting Henry Wade on things. Right. Um, <laughs> and you That's see right. him in the halls. You know, when they're when they're moving Oswald around. Um, you know, and then he gets into the basement there. And so, yeah, I, I think he definitely uh, was able to blend in and, uh, you know, get in there. And well, I he think can, he, he, he contends that right up until the last minute, he wasn't sure he was going to do it. He uh, that's what he said. He said that he, you know, until just you know, he was he was torn between 
should I go do this? As it's just, you know, uh, it's crazy to do it, or should I not do it and risk being whacked by the uh, the mob or, or, or Castro? So uh, I, I think he was really torn when he did it. I don't think he, you know, it wasn't something he really relished. <laughs> yeah, I think it was definitely a last minute kind of thing for him. I mean, he could have done it at any point that weekend, but he waited until the last possible right his right. second, you know, before right. he was going to be um, given over to Decker. Right. Um, Mark, I want to ask you a little bit about what you think about Oswald as far as him being a pro Castro agent. Or was he kind of doing some undercover work? Uh, was he was he really anti Castro, but kind of trying to out pro Castro people? What do you, what, what's your feelings on Oswald? Well, you know, um, he certainly his his historical background seems that he played the fence on both sides. I mean, you know, he he was technically trained. Uh, in the military, uh, he he goes over to Russia. He stays there a few years, uh, thinking that he's a spy. Uh, so you know, Oswald is a very complex character in that sense because if you read it one way, well, he was he was a defector. If you read it another way, well, he was over there, but he was really spying for the CIA. And then if you look at all the things that he ends up being involved with. He's always involved in something that could go either way when he goes to Mexico City. Uh, so, you know, it's hard to really pinpoint exactly what he was because he's so complex. And uh, I find him a fascinating, a fascinating character. Fascinating. Uh, you know, his work in New Orleans and, and what eventually he gets trapped, and, and and also eventually, if you if you think about his life story and thinks about all that he was involved with, just before his death, he he tells it all. He says, "I'm a patsy," and that's exactly what I feel he was. I feel he was being used. Right. I mean, and you can definitely, if you you know, when you can read somebody's face at that moment in time at the midnight press conference when they told him that he had been charged in the murder of the president, you can just see his face almost drop to the floor in a moment of realization that, okay, I've just been screwed royally. And that's, I think to me, that's the point where he kind of figures out what's, what's happening to him. Yeah. You know, to me, the biggest, the the biggest mystery to the whole thing uh, about Oswald is why he left the school book depository building. He didn't have to leave. He worked there. He belonged there. He would not have been it would not have been suspicious to see him there. He only becomes a suspect when he leaves the building. And I, and I cannot figure out why the guy walked out of that building. He was employed. He, he had ridden to work there that morning with a fellow employee. He was going to ride home with the same guy. Why right. did he leave after? Whether he shot him or not, I don't believe he did shoot him, but I can't figure out why the guy left that building. And that's the only well, here's thing what I've, that's suspicious. You, you, you yeah. know, we you know one 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 idea that kind of kind of brings a couple of the dots together was that supposedly he's bringing the curtain rods, right? And mm-hmm. Whether he has a rifle there or what, when he delivers that or or leaves it on the sixth floor or whatever, I think whenever he's down there drinking that Coke and he realizes the shots have gone off, that somehow he was involved with bringing that rifle up there. And that's why he would probably want to leave, I think. Well, that's a that's a good point, Mark, because, you know, in, in doing this show, you see a lot of things and I hear a lot of things. And there's a there's a buddy of mine uh, named Bart Camp. He's part of the Daily Plaza UK uh, scene over there. Yeah. And he's done a lot of great work. He has a he has a website called prayer dash man dot com. And he's done a lot of work 
on uh, the in- Oswald interrogations, the second floor lunchroom encounter, um, the, the school book depository itself. And you basically you basically see the evolution of them eliminating Oswald's alibi. And a lot of these interrogation notes, including Fritz's handwritten notes, bookouts, handwritten notes. And I believe that there's another set of notes where Oswald states he was that he was out watching the presidential parade with with Bill Shelley at the time of the assassination. And you never hear that alibi. It's, it's gone. And, and a lot of these notes didn't come out until the ARRB investigation. And um, the other ones just came out recently. And, you know, to your point, if you read what Frazier did after the assassination, it says, OK, he stood there on the steps for a minute and then went back inside, went to the basement to eat his lunch by himself so maybe after the assassination and all that went down maybe oswald was looking for fraser and you know to see what was going on maybe get a ride home but he couldn't find him so maybe at that point because even in oswald's own words he said that he talked to bill shelley who said that they weren't going to do any more work that day so he left he couldn't find Frazier, so he said, okay, well, I'll just take a bus or cab home or whatever and, uh, you know, go to the movies. It's, it, that seems like a – and to your point of, you know, well, did Oswald bring the rifle into the building that day? You know, according to Frazier, it's a two-foot package that in no way, shape, or form, broken down or not, could have contained that man liquor carcano rifle. But again, if you were the guy – who was brought in, given a lie detector test, have a have a, a confession uh, made up for you, and, and you're told to sign it, and you realize, okay, you just brought the alleged assassin of the president to work, and you knew he had a rifle, and you didn't do anything, could you be a co-conspirator? You kind of want to distance yourself from, from this guy, Oswald, at that point, um, and distance yourself from knowing that he had a rifle. And but the interesting thing is, if he Frazier's HSCA testimony, there's four audio tapes, and two of them are are pretty good quality. You know, you can kind of make out everything just fine, and the other two have degraded a lot over the years, and they're very hard to make out. But there's a section in one of them where Frazier pretty much states, "I was standing right there on the steps." And I knew he hid or had the rifle. And I thought to myself, oh, my God, I don't want to get pulled into this. And, you know, that to me says a lot. And now just because. And just because if hypothetically Oswald did take that rifle into that building, that doesn't mean he was on the sixth floor shooting the rifle, per se, um, because that rifle was registered to a Heidel. A pro Castro fair play for Cuba committee member in New Orleans. It wasn't registered to Oswald. I mean, sure, if you really, really dug, you could figure out, okay, well, it went to this guy Oswald's post office box in, in Dallas, but, um, you know, maybe Oswald wasn't smart enough to put two, maybe he didn't think that they could put two and two together. Maybe they thought, okay, it's going to get blamed on this pro Castro uh, guy, A. Heidel. Um, and that's just my own thinking there. Well, you 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 could be right. You say that that certainly makes sense. Uh, that, that that's logical to think that way. But you the, know, maybe maybe he was told, hey, we're gonna we're gonna shoot some shoot some shots at Kennedy here in the this extreme right southern city. Um, and it's gonna get blamed on this pro Castro guy. You know, we're not gonna kill him, but he'll be scared enough to actually do something about Castro in Cuba, you know, 90 miles off our shore, finally, to make up for his non-action in the Bay of Pigs. Well, that could be right. Uh, I don't know. But there there was, here again, there, another mystery is there is no reason to have to smuggle a gun into the Texas School Book Depository building 
it, it's very easy to get, you know, to, to put guns in the bottom of boxes. There were there were boxes, packages going in and out of that building all day long. Every day they would ship stuff would come in, stuff would go out. That's what they did. It was it's very easy to put a gun, break down that gun and put it in the in a, in a carton of books. And there were books oh, yeah. shipped in there all the time. In fact, uh, some some people think that even the before the assassination, uh, the, the, the Texas School Book Depository was being used for that very thing to run guns and drugs in and out of uh, Dallas for the CIA. Now, nobody can verify that, but there you know, there are rumblings of that I've, I've, that I've heard. Uh, and and uh, Roy Truly himself had two guns in his office. Right. We're there all the time, you know, so for Oswald to have to bring in a gun that morning uh, to shoot the president, I, I don't think they would cut it that closely, but they might. Uh, you never know. If I were setting up an assassination and I knew that Kennedy was coming down that street, I would have the gun in there uh, well in advance of that uh, that day just to make sure it was there. Uh, oh, of that's course. Just, that's, just, that's just, you know, just pure conjecture on my part, but. I, I have a hard time uh, 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 justifying uh, Oswald bringing the gun in that morning uh, uh, when it was, you know, it could have been done any time. And there also, uh, nobody ever talks about the cleaning crew that came that comes in that came in there every day to clean the the building. And they didn't. Oh, yeah. Nobody ever talks about the construction crew that was working in there that very day. Uh, that could have brought gun, the guns in there. So there's so many ways that gun could have gotten in there besides Oswald. It's uh, it's laughable to say that he brought it in there because nobody knows for sure he did. Very true. And I always thought, you know, looking at pictures of the school book depository, you see on that on that east side, uh, the fire fire escape goes all the way up to the sixth floor, and all somebody would have to do is leave that window unlocked, and hey. The, in the middle of the night, go pop, climb up there, pop it open, plant the rifle, and get out. Sure. And nobody be, ever be the wiser. Yeah. But but, but uh, uh, to, have, to have it already stashed there in one of the boxes would be much much simpler. And and those boxes great. were yeah. uh, there were boxes all over the place, and they had been moved around to put to put in new flooring on the fifth and sixth floor. And uh, I, th- I think that. Uh, uh, the building owner had added a couple of people to the crew that uh, that week to speed up the the work so they could get it done before uh, the holidays. So there were a number of people in there that the Warren Commission or the uh, I don't think the uh, even the assassination assassination committee the H HCSA whatever it is uh, I don't think they even addressed that issue of the cleaning crew and the construction crew. In fact, I haven't yeah. seen anybody even mention it, <laughs> except for us. Yeah, not a lot. Not a lot of people know about the uh, the Acme uh, cleaning crew, right? And, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, these guys that were working on on the multiple floors, they're replacing the floors, right? Um, they never, well, they never talk about those guys. And, and yeah, you know, I talk about them. You'd love my show. Oh, good. Well, I'm, I'm gonna have to sure. Do you have any names? <laughs> I do. Oh, good. I want to. I've got to listen to your show. Yes, ch- definitely check it out. Uh, there was a couple episodes ago. I talked about, a lot about the uh, the floor laying crew and the and the chicken bones and all that found on the sixth floor and Bonnie Ray Williams and 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 uh, a couple of the other Negro workers in there. Um, at the time, it's pretty interesting to get, you know, try to figure that out for sure. Well, you know, you know, one thing that to me, it's not really talked about a hell of a lot is just prior to the assassination, how both JFK and Johnson were in deep hot water. I mean, uh, you know, JFK had been sleeping with Ellen Romich, uh, doing pillow talk and talking about, you know, visit visiting different missile sites in West and in, in 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 Europe, and Johnson was on the hot seat with the Billy Saul Esther scandal. So really, the assassination of JFK 
sort of kill two birds with one stone because it, 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 the whole part about him sleeping with the East German spy, which could have cost him re-election, was yeah. out the window. And the whole thing with Billy Saul Estes would have cost Johnson, and that's out the window. So the the lead up to the assassination is also something that people need to talk about. Oh, definitely, definitely. Now to, to get back to your to, to get back to your book a little bit, uh, Mark, if you can if you can talk to us a little bit about the the genesis of the Pilar story and why she possibly did what she did. Um, I think that part is, is fascinating as well. Well, I mean, you know, um, her background, you know, she was certainly abused uh, by JFK and and uh, whenever he came. Th- those junkets to Cuba, whenever JFK was a congressman, were paid for by the government, and they were supposed to be going down there checking on sugar production. And all they were doing is going down there and chase women, kind of like what I was doing. Um, right. And so, uh, and of course, you know, uh, if you look at some of the old clips of of the of the advertising that was done for the for that time for Cuba, uh, you know, sex was a big draw. That was a big reason to go to Cuba. And uh, of course, the gambling was there, and it was wide open. Oh, yeah. It was it was bigger and better than Las Vegas. Uh, and so, you know, she's drawn into that because, you know, he was there. He's there to, to have sex and she's living in the brothel. Her mother's a, uh, you know, a prostitute there. So that whole bringing up for her would sort of callous her character and, and to where she didn't quite have any qualms about whacking somebody. And probably that was in the back of her mind for, for many years to come as she worked for Fidel Castro and the revolution. <clears throat> of course, honing her <clears throat> ability to to use a rifle in Russia. I mean, she she became quite a a figure in terms of whacking people. And uh and that opportunity obviously came up whenever the mob hired her to go to Houston. I mean, to Dallas. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, it seems. Out. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it seems, uh, Richard, that, you know, the use of a woman back, you know, back in the 50s and 60s was kind of uh, unprecedented and kind of unexpected. And you figure, you know, like. Like uh, women could get in a lot of places that certain men couldn't. Um, they were very good at acquiring information and being used by these intelligence agencies uh, for a variety of things. I mean, you could even say the same for Marina and and the Russians. Right. Um, you know, I find it I find it very hard to believe that, uh, you know, in a country that big, that one poor pharmacy student could meet three uh, United States defectors have relations with two of them and marry one of them. <laughs> right. That just exactly. seems like astronomical odds to me, unless right. she was put on these guys for a reason. Yeah. And I think a lot of the, a lot of the FBI activity concerning them when they came back and their interest in the Oswalds, if you will. And I think the, the genesis for, you know, Lee Oswald, kind of leaving that note at the FBI headquarters, like, you know, leave my wife alone, you know, but I think the, the FBI was tasked when the Oswalds came back from Russia to kind of keep an eye on them and her in particular, because they knew that the Russians would definitely not shy away from using these women sent back over here as these wives to be uh, spies. And I think the FBI was tasked a lot to to look after these people, uh, you know, upon returning to the United States, almost to the point of harassment to where, you know, you would be upset enough to go to the FBI office and say, and say, hey, look, you know, leave my wife alone. Leave us alone. We're not, you know, we're not doing anything. 
you know, hey, I, you know, I'm giving you guys information, <laughs> you know, uh, leave yeah, me alone. Right. Yeah. No, I, I I totally agree with that. Uh, but back to Pilar, I mean, being a woman, um, you know, assassin. Yeah, I'm sure you know that uh, the, the Cuban Revolution, women played a huge role in the Cuban Revolution. I mean, it, if, if it hadn't been for Celia Sanchez, there wouldn't have been a revolution. She was the brains behind that whole thing. Castro was this bumbling idiot, actually, <laughs> who had a lot of charisma. and He could get people to do things that I, I still don't understand to this day how he got to do them. But Celia Sanchez and the other women, uh, a lot of some of the other women in Cuba, they were they played a big role in that that revolution and the, the, in fact they had an entire br- brigade called the Marianas that were nothing but women and they were the best fighters uh, and Pilar was a part of that for a while uh, until she was pulled out and and and, and uh, designated as a political assassin and she went and she she would go into Santiago and Havana and whack uh, high level government officials military uh, people and so forth so after the revolution. Uh, she, along with a number of other women, were sent to Russia uh, to be trained as spies and assassins, with this, you know, specifically to be sent into the U.S. to protect uh, Cuban interests uh, against the U.S. Uh, the U.S. was was really harassing Cuba. They were you know, going down there, blowing up refineries, and you know, they even blew up a ship uh, in the harbor down there, and I think in 1960. And I think that was sort of the last uh, straw for Castro when uh, when they blew up that uh, uh, I forget the name of the ship like Lacubri or I, I can't remember but it was a uh, Kubrick. Yeah. Okay. Well, anyway, that was sort of the last straw for uh, for Castro, and he sent uh, uh, Pilar and some other. There she wasn't alone. There there were some other uh, uh, very good looking women that uh, were part of that uh, that whole operation. And, of course, she goes to where, uh, you know, where the power is. She goes to Washington, ends up in Washington, D.C. at the Quorum Club there, uh, where a lot of, uh, you know, congressmen uh, would would come for extracurricular activities. And and even the president went there a couple of times. And she gets to know a number of the uh, other girls there. And uh, there was a lot of uh, there was some hanky panky that she was involved in in the White House. She being Pilar. She was in the White House uh, with, uh, I think, one time with uh, Ellen Rompage, if you believe the story that I was told about this. <laughs> so right. uh, a lot of the, there were there were uh, it was it, it made a lot of sense to uh, for Castro to use whatever resources he had. And, and he knew that uh, that women uh, could could certainly get the job done. Uh, so I. I, I agree with you, too, that uh, Marina Oswald was certainly a lot more than just Lee Harvey Oswald's wife. <laughs> I Great. think she was, if anything, his, uh, either his cover or his handler. I don't know which, but uh, she was definitely involved in something besides just marrying that schmuck. <laughs> I don't know why she would Yeah, ever... it seems to me, you know, there are intelligence agencies, you know, they went to a lot of extent to try to cover up the fact that they were you know, their assassination programs and that they were trying to get to Castro using the mafia and these anti-Castro Cubans and, and, and all this other stuff. But yet somehow, some way, you know, this this uh, this dictator <laughs> 90 miles off our shore manages to outsmart them and out evade them at every turn and manage to stay in power, at least between the Castros for another, what, 60 years? Yeah. Yeah. Or, Without or repercussions. Raul Castro is still alive. <laughs> right. They have, what, six or seven presidents. Uh, and they were constantly being uh, they were constantly being tried to uh, limit. They, the U.S. was constantly trying to eliminate the guy and they never could do it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it seems to me like they didn't really want to, if you know what I mean. Like, yeah. like you were saying, they might have had a lot of information about things going you know, going on here in the U.S. that maybe they it was a bargaining tool for Castro to, you know, just leave me alone, you know, right. kind of thing. Right, right. And uh, Castro, uh, the guy was a, a you know, apparently a, t- a total tyrant and uh, just extremely ruthless. But 
he had uh, he had something going for him. I don't know what it was, but uh, he he could get women to do whatever he wanted them to do. Seems like. And uh, yeah, oh yeah, I mean awesome. look at the story of Marita Marita Lorenz and and and, and yeah. uh, Frank Fiorini and all that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. How how do you convince you know, a hot hot looking socialite to go hawk your jewels and give them to me to, to stage a revolution? <laughs> right. Amazing. Yeah. I know. It's crazy stuff. <laughs> Now, I would be remiss if I didn't revisit a little nugget because everything I can learn, I love to learn. So you, you had some kind of knowledge and interaction with Oswald at the beginning of the show. I wanted you to expand on that a little bit. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, a couple of just very, very minor incidents. But uh, the first time I encountered Oswald is I was uh, – we. I was riding with my brother in Irving, Texas. We were going over to look at a car, a used car I was going to buy to, to drive to college. And Oswald was hitchhiking up Irving Boulevard. So my brother stopped and picked him up. <laughs> and uh, we uh, we drove we have, we drove him you know, a few miles and dropped him off. Uh, and he had very little to say. He was kind of a, you know, a, a quiet, introspective guy, it seems like. He had very little to say. So I got I got no I can glean nothing from that except he was in my car right. in the back seat of my car for about ten minutes. Uh, uh, another incident was uh, in I forgot the, it was, I think it's 1963 I believe the summer of 1963 when Edwin Walker we called him Crazy Eddie because the guy was a nut job but uh, he he was involved with the uh, uh, John Birch Society, the, the, the John Birch Society was just revving up at that time. Mm-hmm. And I was going to well, I, I was going to a, a commuter college called Arlington State College, which is now Tex- University of Texas at Austin. But at the time, uh, I, I was commuting from my apartment in Oak Cliff to uh, Arlington, where the college is. And I would I, I rode I, with a couple of guys who were young Republicans. And they were always talking about the John Birch Society and they convinced me to go to a um, a, a co- some kind of conflict they were having at the convention center where Edwin Walker was going to be the guest speaker so my wife and I go to this uh, uh, the, uh, this meeting or this uh, gathering there were a lot of there were maybe a couple thousand people there and when uh Walker gets on the stage and starts talking. He's the guy's such a nut. My wife and I say, oh, we're not going to listen to this crap. So we get up to leave. And as we're leaving, so was Lee Harvey Oswald. He was there. Lee Harvey Oswald walked out. In fact, he held the door open for us to walk out the door of the, uh, the uh, Dallas Convention Center. So he was there uh, uh, at the John Birch meeting uh, in Dallas. Sometimes was Sometime in the summer, I believe in 1963. I believe that's right. So that's my this is my second encounter with Oswald, which means absolutely nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but that's I did, just I, another fascinating brush with history, you know. I guess. Did he so. recognize you from the from the hitch ride? No, no, he didn't. No, he didn't. And I and I don't no. know if the hitch ride was before or after this. You know, and of course right. at that time Oswald was a nobody. I didn't know who the guy was and. He had yeah. become famous. Yeah. You know, he, he's just some of the guys, some of the face in the crowd, you know. So I thought nothing of it either way. Except I thought, well, the wow. guy's got the guy's got sense enough to get out and leave this uh this uh, uh, crazy guy talking up on stage. And Walker was definitely frothing at the mouth crazy. He was he was a nut job. I mean he was oh, really yeah. off the rails. So but uh, yeah, and 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 Walker had you talk about guys with motive. He had plenty of motive to kill Kennedy, but I don't know whether he was involved or not. That's the thing about Kennedy. There were yeah. so many people who had a had a reason to kill the guy. <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> it's hard to narrow it down. Yeah, I know. Because everybody know. had a, <laughs> had a grievance with Kennedy. Yeah, there was a really great book released a couple of years ago called General Walker and the Assassination of President Kennedy by Dr. Jeffrey yeah. Caulfield. Yeah. And, and uh, it's it's a he, he lays out a very convincing case, you know, for 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 Walker to be involved in everything. Yeah. And, you know? and Oswald could have been working with Walker as far as, you know, that that's that's a possibility. Uh, 
they're uh, yeah because i don't think that shooting was a real assassination attempt at walker i think it was more of an attempt to for publicity and sympathy you i know? totally agree i totally agree with that i i i concur wholeheartedly that that's a that's a definite uh possibility <laughs> because uh at the time oswald i mean uh, walker was getting some it's a bad press. Oh, yeah. Saying. Yeah. And like you said, he was ramping up for, uh, you know, going on these uh, talking lectures and, and hell, even even running for uh, president. In yeah, right. Exactly. You know, that, that, that did come up. Yeah. Well, guys, it's been a fascinating to talk to you. Um, if you could let everybody know uh, where your website again and, and where they can get your books. Well, the website is The Girl Who Shot JFK, and there's a book of the same title, uh, which you can buy on Amazon or you can buy on the website. Um, so I think that uh, it's you'll find it interesting. There's a lot of uh, information that's in the book that's not covered. We didn't cover today or that's not, not covered on the website. And um, you do have other books as well, right? We do. You all have written together? Yes, we've written three novels. Uh, they, these are all Cold War spy novels, and they all... Uh, are sort of related to the Kennedy assassination, but not, uh, it's sort of in the, it's sort of the backdrop, but there's one titled the girl who came calling. And a third one titled, uh, the girl with something to hide, which involves the missing Raphael painting from world war two that, uh, our girl Pilar comes in possession of after she whacks mobster lucky Luciano. <laughs> so it's a pretty wow. interesting story. The girl gets around. Yeah, that'll be the next book. <laughs> and, the, and, the, and the books are and the books are also on Kindle, it's a hard copy or Kindle. Right, excellent. Yeah, and and folks, we've we've just touched touched the tip of the iceberg here today um, to tantalize your uh, your your juices. And I would highly recommend checking out the website. Go go buy the book. Um, it's a very fascinating story. And 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 Mark and Richard, I appreciate you. Uh, very much coming on the show today and talking about it. I hope you had fun doing it. We did. We certainly did. Excellent. You guys hang on for me for a second. Um, folks, please give me a follow on Twitter at the Loon Gummin 7. Make sure you're checking out the YouTube channel, the Loon Gummin Podcast, and like and subscribe. I would greatly appreciate it. And make sure you leave uh, a review on iTunes for this podcast. It helps uh, with exposure. That's it for episode 202. Thank you so much for joining me and we'll see you next time, folks. <laughs>